Howdy. Um, let me move this out of the way. Today is March 4th. It's the anniversary of the death of 22-year-old Shamika Shaw at Kermit Gosnell's clinic. And instead of just um, reciting, sharing some information I gathered, I want to take part of the grand jury report, and then I want to let you listen to what Shamika's cousin has to say about how this young woman died. So this mm -hmm. is from the Gosnell Grand Jury Report. You can Google Gosnell Grand Jury Report and bring up the PDF yourself and read it. And I'm going to read some stuff that I think is very, very relevant. Okay. The State Department of Health failed to investigate Gosnell's clinic even in response to complaints. According to DOH witnesses, the DOH instituted a policy of inspecting abortion clinics only when there was a complaint. In fact, this grand jury's investigation makes clear the department did not even do that. Janice Stolowski, one of the evaluators of Goddess Nell's Clinic in 1992, 10 years later was director of DOH's Division of Home Health, the unit that is inexplicably responsible for overseeing the quality of care in abortion clinics. In January 2002, an attorney representing Shamika Shaw, a 22-year-old woman who had died following an abortion at Gosnell's clinic, wrote to Stolowski requesting copies of inspection reports for any on-site inspections of the clinic conducted by DOH. Stolowski wrote to the attorney, the attorney that no inspections had been conducted since 1993 because DOH had received no complaints about the clinic in that time except that it had. In 1996, another attorney representing a different patient of Gosnell's informed Stolowski's predecessor as the director of the Home Health Division that his client had suffered a perforated uterus requiring a radical hysterectomy as a result of Gosnell's negligence. The Home Health Director discussed this patient with DOH Senior Counsel Kenneth Brody, and the complaint report was documented in records and turned over to the grand jury. It surely was available to, to Stolowski when she inaccurately told the attorney in 2002 that the DOH received no complaints regarding Gosnell's clinic. Interesting about to come up. Not documented in the records turned over to the grand jury was a second complaint registered between 1996 and 1997. This one was hand-delivered to the Secretary of Health's Administrative Assistant by Dr. Donald Schwartz, now Philadelphia's Health Commissioner. Dr. Schwartz, a pediatrician, is the former head of Adolescent Services at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and was the directing physician of a private practice in West Philadelphia. For 17 years, he treated teenage girls from the West Philadelphia community. Occasionally, he referred patients who wanted to terminate their pregnancies to abortion providers. Gosnell's clinic was originally included as a provider in the referral information that Dr. Schwartz gave his patients. He and his physician partners noticed, however, that patients who had abortions at Women's Medical Society were returning to their private practice soon after infected with trichomoniasis, a sexually transmitted parasite that they did not have before the abortions. When this happened repeatedly, Dr. Schwartz sent a social worker to visit Women's Medical Society. Dr. Schwartz stopped referring patients to the clinic. He also hand-delivered a letter of formal complaint to the Office of the Pennsylvania Secretary of Health. Dr. Schwartz told the grand jury that he does not know what happened to his complaint. He never heard back from the DOH, and the department did not include it in their response to the grand jury subpoena requesting all complaints relating to Gosnell's clinic. We know that no inspection resulted. We are very troubled that state of health officials ignored this respected physician's report that girls were becoming infected from sexually transmitted diseases. Skip ahead. We also do not understand how a report of this magnitude was not at least added to Gosnell's file at the State Department of Health. It suggests to us that there may have been many more complaints that were never turned over to the grand jury. Okay. Let's skim down a little. 
In addition to the two complaints filed in 1996 and 1997, Stolowski herself received two inquiries from attorneys' offices about Gosnell's clinic in the first two months of 2002. One was from the Shaw family's attorney, the other was from a paralegal for yet a third attorney who phoned her on February 6, 2002, asking for information concerning the clinic. Surely, those two inquiries in 2002 should have alerted Stolowski that there were complaints from at least two people about the clinic, complaints serious enough to warrant civil attorney's involvement, yet she ordered no investigation of the clinic, even though it had not been site-reviewed in nine years. Okay, so that is what the state officials were doing, or rather not doing, about Gosnell's clinic. Now, let's hear what Shamika's cousin has to say. I'm not going to play the whole thing. This is a clip from a documentary, 3801 Lancaster, that I really recommend that everybody watch. I uh, think I'm the only one member of this house that was directly touched by the tragedy um, at the Gosnell Clinic. In the life of my 22-year-old cousin, Shamika Shaw, oh. she had just, you know, she had finished school, um, she liked to hang out and have a good time with her her cousins. They knew everything there was to know about Zamika. You could find out from the other cousins um, that were around her. So she was just a very alive, very friendly, um, very gregarious, um, fun individual. She was working. Um, she was looking to move out. Um, she really wanted to be on her own, stand on her own two feet. I think her the cousins were thinking about getting a place together, pulling, pulling their resources. They, it was their time to strike out and be an adult, you know, um, at that time in, in their lives. So March of 2000, Shamika Shaw, a 22-year-old mother of two, I, I don't remember Gosnell's where clinic. I was, but I, I remember um, getting the phone call. Um, I remember that it was late, and... Um, they said that um, Shamika was was dead, and they were crying. I got the call from one of the cousins, and um, it was hard to understand what was going on on the phone. And I, I just, you know, I was kind of suspended in dis disbelief because she was so young, and. Um, you know, and I didn't even think she was as old as 22, you know, in my mind's eye, you know, you see somebody grow up, you know, it's like, she's a baby. You, what do you mean she's gone? And um, so I went over to the house, and, and that's when I, you know, started to hear um, you know, their description of her last night um, on Earth. And um, I was, uh, I was just devastated. Um, she was bleeding profusely. She was writhing on the floor. Um, she was in so much pain, and they were trying to get her to go to the hospital. They didn't know what to do. Um, they were told that they could not call back to the clinic if it was a problem. Don't call the clinic if it was a problem. So they, they were afraid to call the clinic, and you know, then they tried to call and couldn't get anybody. And she literally was bleeding and writhing in pain on the floor, just rolling and screaming until finally uh, her mother came home and um, they took her to the hospital. And, um, and not long after that, she was gone. They, they told me that part of the placenta was left in uh, the womb and um, that they had to take her back because she was in pain immediately to get more of it removed. The, the official story is that she died from a perforated uterus and sepsis. So she was literally bleeding and the infection was just festering inside of her body from the placenta and now we know the place was filthy. Um, and so all of this was going on and, um, and that was how she um, 
she died. I've eulogized most of my family members that have passed since um, since I've been a minister, and I've eulogized other people. I have not been able to eulogize anyone um, since that service. Her cousins, they just were screaming her name, and, and we called her Mika. And they just kept saying, Mika, 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 you can't be gone. Open your eyes, open your eyes. And they were trying to pick her up. And I had to um, I had to go over to the casket to stop them from trying to resurrect her um, in whatever way they thought they were going to do that. And they just couldn't deal with the fact that she was gone. And, um, and I had to try to bring the service back to order and um, and get them through that moment um, and even through um, the burial, they, they didn't go because um, they just couldn't and I, I didn't want them to go. I didn't know what they were going to do at that point. I didn't know if they would even try to go into the grave to get her out. They just could not reconcile themselves to the fact that she was gone. And um, it was just the most horrible thing, uh, one of the most horrible things that I've um, experienced. And that was entirely preventable. The Department of Health, Department of State, knew how bad this place was and chose to ignore it. 